Hello and welcome to my presentation for Topic 1, Atomic Structure and the Periodic Table for Edexcel A-Level Chemistry. Uh, make sure that you uh, take notes as you go along and that you re-listen to any harder bits uh, and that you do whatever it takes to get this stuff into your head because it is not all easy. Right, so we start off looking at the history of the development of the model of the atom and it starts way back with this fella here. Democritus, an ancient Greek philosopher, back in 460 to 370 BC. Now he did this thought experiment, um, and he reasoned that if you cut a stone in half, you make a smaller stone. That's not not tremendously revolutionary, um, but he said importantly that that smaller stone would have the same properties as the bigger stone it came from. And he reasoned that if you kept on cutting it in half, you kept on getting smaller and smaller stones. But eventually, you would get to the smallest possible piece of stone, which can't be divided into anything smaller. And he named these tiny individual pieces atomos, because atomos means indivisible. Now, he reasoned that different substances were made of different atomos that each had their own properties, um, which explained why different substances had different properties, because they were made of different atomoses. Now, significantly, this was not science, this was philosophy, because he did not base his reasoning on experiments. It was based purely on thought. And his ideas were not widely accepted at his time at the uh, by his contemporaries at the time, who went with the four elements theory of earth, wind, fire and water, which we now know is complete nonsense. Our next stop in the history of the atom is this chap here, John Dalton, um, and he put together his theory in around 1808. Now, importantly, his theory was based on experimental evidence from having looked very carefully at uh, you know, a lot of different reactions involving elements and compounds and looking at the different ways they combine and trying to explain that with his theory. So he proposed that elements are made of extremely small particles called atoms. Similar to Democritus' idea, but again, importantly, based on evidence this time. Now he said that the atoms of a given element are identical in size and mass and their other properties, and that atoms of different elements have different sizes and masses and other properties. He said that atoms cannot be subdivided, they cannot be created or destroyed. He said that atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios to form chemical compounds. And he said that in chemical reactions, atoms are combined and separated uh, or rearranged. Now, this pretty much works as a, as a basic model of an atom today. And in fact, I think a lot of the time when I'm thinking of atoms, it's John Dalton's model that I'm thinking of. But we have to be aware that it isn't perfect. So we do know now that, for example, atoms of a given element are not always identical in mass because of the existence of isotopes. Some are heavier than others, and that can also affect their properties. For example, some atoms or some isotopes of an element will be radioactive, others won't be. We also know about subatomic particles uh, and nuclear fission and nuclear fusion, which means that this section here about atoms not being able to be subdivided, created or destroyed, is not entirely true as well. But those issues aside, this theory does basically work pretty well, especially bearing in mind it was, come, you know, it was in, you know, developed over 200 years ago. Now, on to J.J. Thompson. He developed the idea of the electron. Now, J.J. Thompson was the, uh, investigating cathode rays. Now, a cathode ray is produced in one of these things here. This is a cathode ray tube, okay? And what it is, it's a glass tube with most of the air removed from it. And in there, we've got quite a few bits and pieces, as you can see. Um, here, we've got a cathode. Now, this is a negative electrode. And it's also hooked up to our anode as well. You can see there's a little gap in the anode. That gap is going to be important in a second. This is our positive electrode, okay? Now, between the two is something like a 15,000 volt uh, potential difference. There's also a heater in there as well. Now the heater is important because um, the cathode, as well as having this very high um, potential difference, also is very hot. Now he found that when you had this set up, that these rays would leave the cathode and hit the screen at the end. Now how do you know anything was happening is because this screen is coated in phosphor and so it was glowing when these invisible rays hit it okay now it gets more interesting because over here we've got another set of electric plates and they're charged negative here and positive up here and what he found was that when he did apply a charge between these two plates the beam rather than going straight on it got deflected and went over here. So he realized that that beam of rays coming from the cathode 
had some kind of negative charge and he realized it must be made of these tiny little negative particles which he ended up naming electrons and through further investigation he found out that those little particles had a mass about one thousand so about one two thousandth of the mass of a hydrogen atom he also did other, did other investigations he tried changing the material the cathode was made from the gas that was in the tube and it did not affect his results which told him that these electrons that he discovered were some sort of fundamental particle that was produced but or produced by every material and therefore was contained in every material and that led to the development of this idea here the plum pudding model of atoms in which an atom is made out of a ball of solid positive charge with little negative electrons distributed throughout it and he he thought at least that when you were heating the cathode over here the these negative electrons were being spat out of the uh, atoms and that's what was causing these cathode rays now we know that's not entirely true but it does at least account for the observations that he saw so on now to ernest rutherford um, working in 1909 standing on the shoulders of giants really because his ideas were only sort of possible to develop because of the results of the experiments of Geiger and Marsden. Now, what they were doing was they were firing alpha particles um, from a radioactive source at a very thin sheet of gold leaf. Now, if you remember, alpha particles are made of two protons and two neutrons. They didn't know that at the time, but we do now. And they were firing them at this sheet of gold leaf like this. OK, now. Surrounding the gold leaf was a screen made out of phos or coated with phosphor, which glows whenever an alpha particle hits it. And what he found was that most of the glowing came from this area of the screen here, which meant that most of the alpha particles were going straight through the gold leaf, which seems impossible. How can an alpha particle travel straight through something solid? They also found that a few of the alpha particles did go through the leaf but not straight they end up sort of being deflected over here somewhere or over here somewhere and even a smaller number rather than going through at all bounced back which is what they expected all of them to do but only a few ended up bouncing back now they couldn't explain these results and that's what Rutherford uh, did he, uh, he he came up with a theory that could explain everything that we saw so he realized that the reason that most of the alpha particles were traveling straight through was because most of the gold was actually empty space and he decided that atoms must be made of a very small positive nucleus surrounded largely by empty space where the electrons are and he reasoned that there must be some particles in the nucleus called protons and they would have a positive charge and the protons would be 2,000 times heavier than the electrons which JJ Thompson had discovered now he realized also that atoms contained equal numbers of protons and electrons and this could explain all of these observations so if thompson was correct either all of the alpha particles would go straight through because somehow they're not affected by the matter or none of them would but it couldn't explain why some did and some didn't but rutherford can so the reason why most went through was because they didn't hit that tiny nucleus the reason why some got deflected over here and over here which because they came close to the nucleus and because the alpha particles are positive the nucleus is positive two positives repelled and that pushed the alpha particles away and some bounced back because they were actually hitting the nucleus of the atoms so rutherford's idea could explain everything and he also reasoned this is important because this will lead on to the next slide he also reasoned um, that as the size of atoms increases the number of protons increased in proportion to the mass of the atoms now that's important because that's wrong and that led on to the discoveries of James Chadwick so what was the problem with with Rutherford's idea well we know that helium has a mass that is four times the mass of hydrogen if Rutherford was right if the mass is four times that of hydrogen the charge should also be four times that of hydrogen but the charge on a helium is only twice that of hydrogen that didn't make sense according to rutherford's model but james chadwick did some experiments that helped to explain it so here's what he did he got our old friend the alpha particle and he was firing them at a beryllium target here okay now he found that when he did that some invisible radiation was produced that had no charge now how do we know it had no charge 
is because if you passed it through some charged plates, it didn't get deflected. It wasn't affected by that at all. Now, when this invisible radiation hit this paraffin target, it caused the release of protons, and those protons got detected over here. Okay. So, Chadwick explained these results by uh, reasoning that the invisible radiation coming from the beryllium was actually a very small particle which had no charge, which he called the neutron. And he, you know, through his experiments, he determined that the charge on the, on the neutron was zero, and the mass of it was one. And that could now explain this mystery of helium. Because if you say that helium, with its mass that is four times greater than hydrogen, if you say, yes, it's got two protons, but it's also got two neutrons, that now explains why it's four times heavier, but only has twice the charge. And so now this leads us on to our, our modern day model of the nuclear atom, with the nucleus in the middle, made of protons and neutrons, and the electrons orbiting around the outside in shells. So we've got these protons with a mass of one, a charge of plus one located in the nucleus, neutrons with a mass of one, a charge of zero also located in the nucleus, and electrons with a charge of one over 1840, a charge of minus one and located in shells. Just worth noting, the one issue with this uh, diagram as you see it is the nucleus is not to scale. The nucleus is actually roughly 100 thousandth of the diameter of the overall atom. So to give an idea of that, if you made a scale model of an atom with a football as its nucleus, the electrons would be orbiting around about 11 kilometers away. Atomic number and mass number. These are two really important numbers that define every single uh, element on the periodic table. Now the atomic number is always written at the bottom and has the symbol Z. The atomic number tells you the number of protons. And also, if we're talking just about an atom rather than an ion, it tells you the number of electrons too. So in this case, for antimony, antimony, because its atomic number is 51, has 51 protons and 51 electrons. Now, the atomic number is the most important number for any element, because if you change the atomic number, you change the element, because it's the number of protons that determines which element you have. The mass number is the top number on the periodic table, and it tells you the number of protons and the number of neutrons together. That's because both protons and neutrons have a mass of one, so the mass of the atom is going to be the number of those two combined together. To work out the number of neutrons, super easy, you just do the mass number minus the atomic number. So again, in the case of antimony here, the mass number is 121. The atomic number is 51, so 121 minus 51 equals 70. Now onto the number of electrons. We've said already that with atoms it's super easy, the number of electrons is just the atomic number. However, with ions, you need to adjust for the charge. Remember, an ion is an atom that has gained or lost electrons. Negative ions have gained electrons and positive ions have lost electrons. So to calculate the number of electrons in an ion, you just have to take the atomic number and subtract the charge. So in the case of antimony three minus here, the atomic number is 51. Subtract the charge, the charge is minus three. So we do 51 minus minus three, that gives us 54 electrons in antimony three minus. In the case of antimony six plus here, again, we can do the atomic number minus the charge, so 51 minus 6 this time equals 45 electrons in antimony 6 plus. Mass spectrometry is an analytical technique that tells us two things. We can use it to determine the mass of some particles and the abundance of them, so how many of them there are. Now rather than actually telling us the mass per se, it tells us something called mz, which is the mass to charge ratio. Now at A level, we can think of that as being exactly the same as mass, but when if you, you know, go on to study further at degree level, you'll find that it's not quite that simple. But for now, just think of mz as being the mass of an ion or an element or whatever it is that we're talking about. Now, how do they work? There's quite a few different types of mass spectrometer, but they all work in a similar way. You get your sample, whether that is an element or a compound or a protein or whatever it is, and you inject it into the instrument and you vaporize it. Then it is ionized 
to positive ions. So we need some way to knock electrons off our sample. Now in a simple mass spectrometer, that might be something like firing a beam of electrons at it and using those electrons to knock other electrons off the sample. Then once we've got these positive ions, they're going to be accelerated by some positively charged plates and then they're going to be separated. Now there's a few different ways to separate them. You can separate the ions by deflecting them through a magnetic field. You could separate them by measuring their time of flight because they're going to fly at different speeds. Or you could use something called a transmission quadrupole. We don't need to know the details of these other than just to know that there are different ways to separate them. Now importantly at the end of the mass spectrometer is a detector which counts the um, number of ions of each mass and we get a graph from it that looks something like this okay now you can see on the x-axis we've got the m to z ratio and on the y-axis we've got the relative abundance um, normally normalized so that something is set to 100 and for example i think this is the mass spectrum of boron if you look at the mass spectrum of boron you can see there are two peaks there is a peak at an mz of 10 which comes out to a relative abundance of around 25. And another one with an MZ of 11 here, which comes out to a relative abundance of 100. You may have been wondering on that last slide, why it is that boron, which is a single element, had two peaks on its mass spectrum. The reason for that is the existence of isotopes. Isotopes are different versions of the same element that have a different mass. So what we can say is they have the same atomic number, but a different mass number. Or we could say they've got the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. Now, because isotopes have got the same number of protons, that means the isotopes of an element have identical chemical properties. There are some slight differences in their reaction rates, but other than that, they'll do all the same reactions uh, in all the same ways. Isotopes of the same element have small differences in their physical properties. So they could have um, higher densities, higher melting temperatures, higher boiling temperatures, but those are small differences. It's nothing dramatic. To talk about the different isotopes of an element, we have to use the phrase relative isotopic mass. This is the mass of an isotope relative to one twelfth of the mass of carbon 12. And you can see it written in a couple of different ways. So in symbol form, the three different isotopes of carbon are written like this, 12C, 13C and 14C, with the 12, 13 and 14 written superscript and to the left of the symbol. Or we could write it in word form as carbon 12, carbon 13 and carbon 14 like that. The relative atomic mass of an element given the symbol AR, note the little subscript R there, is the average mass of the at atoms of that element relative to one twelfth of the mass of carbon 12. Now, it is an average, and it has to be an average because of the existence of different isotopes. So if we look at our mass spectrum for lead here, lead has got these four different isotopes, lead 204, lead 206, lead 207, and lead 208. But note that we've got very, very different amounts of each of those isotopes. So the relative intensity for lead 208 is 100. That is, the, that is the maximum one. But the relative intensity for lead 204 is only 2.7. For lead 206, it's uh, 46.0. And for lead 207, it's 42.2. So we've got very different amounts of each isotope. So our average can't be a straight average where we just do 204 plus 206 plus 207 plus 208 divided by 4. That won't work because it doesn't take account of the fact that we've got much more 208 and much less 204. So what we're going to do here is use this equation. Relative atomic mass equals the sum, that is a Greek letter sigma, which means sum, the sum of the mass times the abundance of each of our isotopes divided by the sum of the abundances. So let's see how that plays out for lead here. So we're going to say AR of lead, so PB, get the presentation right, equals the sum of the mass times the abundances. So the mass of the first isotope is 204 times by 2.7, because that's its abundance, plus 206 times 46.0 plus 207 times 42.2 
plus 208 times 100. Then you divide all of that by the sum of the masses, so the sum of the uh, abundances. So you do uh, 2.7 plus 46.0 plus 42.2 plus 100 and if you stick that with the calculator it will come out as 207.2 and that's how you calculate relative atomic mass so just to recap it is the sum of the mass times the abundance for each isotope divided by the sum of the abundances relative molecular mass and relative formula mass we're talking here about the masses of compounds molecules things generally more complex than just an atom now relative molecular mass has the symbol mr note the subscript r here okay um, and that is the sum of the relative atomic masses of all of the atoms in the molecular formula of a compound so if we look at the example here 2 bromo 2 methyl propane ch3 c ch3 br ch3 to calculate the relative Molecular mass is really easy. We're going to say MR uh, in brackets uh, CH3, C, CH3, BR, CH3 equals four lots of carbon. One, two, three, four. So we're going to say four times C plus nine lots of hydrogen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So plus nine times H plus one bromine. So one times Br. So that is four times 12 plus nine times one plus one times 79.9. That's a relative atomic mass of bromine. And that comes to a total of 136.9. And note, because it is a relative number, there are no units. Then we have relative formula mass, again, has the symbol M subscript R. Now, the only difference really here is now we're talking about the mass of something that doesn't form molecules. And, you know, most ionic compounds don't form molecules. Giant covalent compounds don't form molecules. So that is the only difference. And it's quite a, dis quite a subtle difference. So in this example, we've got cobalt chloride hexahydrate. I thought I'd throw this example in because it's got this funny thing here where we've got cocl 26 h 20 what on earth does that mean? You can treat the dot 6 h 20 as being something like this, H2O in brackets 6. So it just means 6 lots of water as well as our cocl 2 We'll meet things like that as we go further through the course. So again, calculate the relative formula. So we're going to say MR in brackets because that's what we're finding out. Then always put the formula in brackets next to it, so cocl 2 dot six h two o this won't get you any marks it's important to say that but what it does is it makes it clear to the examiner what you're calculating and when we come on to some of the more complicated calculations later where you're going to be finding lots of relative masses and chucking them all together and seeing what comes out it's really important that you are very clear which mass is which so that's why it makes sense to label it in the way i have done here so we're going to say the relative mass of cobalt chloride hexahydrate is one times cobalt plus two times chlorine, two there, plus 12 times hydrogen, because we've got six of those waters, and six times oxygen, because we've got, again, six of those waters. So let's stick our numbers in. One times relative atomic mass of cobalt is 58.9. You can find that in the periodic table. Plus two times 35.5 for chlorine. plus 12 times one for hydrogen, plus six times 16 for oxygen. And that comes to a grand total of 237.9. And again, note there are no units. A diatomic molecule is a molecule made of just two atoms like you know, hydrogen, H2 or chlorine, Cl2, and so on. And if we look at their mass spectra, um, what we find is there are going to be two sets of peaks for the mass spectrum of a diatomic molecule. First set of peaks is due to the molecule itself. And the second set of peaks is due to fragmentation of the molecule. This is the idea that it will break up during 
the process of mass spectrometry. So for example, some of our chlorine molecules will go through the mass spectrometer unscathed, but others of them will break up into two chlorine atoms. And both of these, both the original Cl molecules and our individual chlorine atoms, they will both feature on our mass spectrum. Now this picture is further complicated by the existence of isotopes. So for example, our chlorine atoms here, some of them will be chlorine 35 and some of them chlorine 37, and they will each have their own separate peak on the mass spectrum. So let's look at the example of chlorine in a little bit more detail. So chlorine is made of 75% chlorine 35 atoms and 25% of it is chlorine 37 atoms. So that means that if we look at the peaks coming from CO2 molecules, there will be three peaks because there are going to be three different ways to combine chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 to form Cl2. So some of our molecules will contain two chlorine 35 atoms. Some of them will contain a chlorine 35 and a chlorine 37, and also the related combination, chlorine 37 and chlorine 35, the order does matter. And some of them will be made of chlorine 37 atoms only. Now we need to be able to predict the relative height of each of those peaks. And this is just a question of probability using these percentage values here. Okay. So the relative height of the chlorine 35, chlorine 35 peaks. So that's going to have an overall mass of 70. So the relative height of that peak is going to be 0.75 because that's the percentage chance of finding one chlorine 35 atom times by 0.75 because that's the probability of finding a second chlorine 35 atom and so that will equal 0.5625 okay so what about our peak at chlorine so uh, peak at 72 made out of chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 or chlorine 37 and chlorine 35 so chlorine 35 we said the probability of one of those was 0 0.75 the probability of a chlorine 37 is 25 percent so we're going to say times 0 0.25 and they're going to time that whole thing by two because the probability of a 35 and a 37 is going to be the same as the probability of a 37 and a 35 and that will come to 0.375 like that and finally we're going to have peaks at 74 due to two chlorine 37 atoms and again the probability for that is going to be 0.25 because that is the probability of a chlorine 37 times by 0.25 again another chlorine 37 which will come to 0.0625 and so if we do our mass spectrum of uh, chlorine, what we will find is at 70, 72 and 74, we're going to get these three peaks in that ratio 0 0.5625 to 0 0.375 to 0 0.0625. Now we can simplify that ratio and if we do it comes out to 9 to 6. To one so our chlorine 35 so our peak at number 70 two chlorine 35s is going to have a relative height of nine for our peaks coming from uh, 35 and 37 so peak at 72 we're going to be have a relative height of six and the peak at 74 due to two chlorine 37s is going to have a relative height of one like that Okay. Now we also need to think about our peaks coming from the fragmentation of chlorine. So our chlorine molecules, some of them are going to break down during our uh, measurement and working out their relative heights is much simpler. 75% of them are chlorine 35. So that peak is going to have an intensity of 0.75 and 25% of the chlorine 37. So that would be 0.25. If we simplify that, that's a ratio of 3 to 1. Now, importantly, if we draw those on our spectrum, so we're talking 35 and 37, 
we know the height of the 35 and 37 peak relative to each other. It's 3 to 1, like this. 3 to 1. We do not know. We do not know how the two sets relate to each other. And that is not something you'll be asked to predict. So we're already comparing these two peaks to each other and these three peaks to each other, but not the two sets of peaks together. And we can see here, so sort of rather more professionally drawn, the mass spectrum for chlorine. And we've got our two peaks there for the fragmented chlorine uh, molecules producing just the individual chlorine atoms. And we've got chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. And the peak for chlorine 35 is there. The peak for chlorine 37 is there. And we've got their relative heights of 3 to 1 because of the 75% and 25% abundance. And then over here, we've got our three peaks coming from the overall molecule together with their three different heights, 70, 72, 74, coming from the different combinations. And again, you can see that 9 to 6 to 1 ratio. Uh, and again, just to make the point, we cannot compare the heights of these two peaks relative to the heights of these three peaks. That's not something we can predict or you'll be expected to predict. Now, if we look at the mass spectrum of more complicated molecules, we see a huge array of different peaks with different abundances, and it gets much more complicated than just for our diatomic molecules. Now, this is largely due to the idea of fragmentation, which is that the ionization process breaks the molecule down into smaller pieces and all of those different smaller pieces will show up on our mass spectrum. Now the ion with the highest mass to charge ratio is called the molecular ion uh, and that has the symbol M plus and that is normally the molecule with a single electron lost and it's that that gives us the relative mass of the compound. So in this example of the um, mass spectrum for propane, the ion with the highest mass to charge ratio is over here, um, 44. And actually, if you look at the formula, that's what we'd expect because propane has a relative formula mass of 44. Now, the other peaks represent the molecule broken up into pieces in various different ways. So for example, like here, you can see there's a little peak there with a mass of 43. Uh, that would just be propane having lost a hydrogen atom. But there are others all the way down, like take this one here, 29. What on earth could make 29? Well, let's just explore the different things that could break off our propane. Now, what's the difference between 29 and 44? That is 15. So this peak at 29 means that our propane has lost something with a mass of 15. Now, what has a mass of 15? Let's have a look. CH3 has a mass of 15. So this peak here at 29 represents our propane having lost a CH3. So now it is just C, C, H, 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 with this empty bond there representing this, you know, the, the bit that's broken off where it lost its CH3 group. And similarly, we see over here a peak at 15. This is the CH3 group that has broken off. So the mass spectra of uh, molecules look much more complicated because of the way they can break up during the ionization process. We call the pattern of peaks that you get the fragmentation pattern. So mass spectrometry, as we're starting to see, is a very, very useful analytical technique. It's used for determining the isotopic composition of an element. We can use it to determine the relative atomic mass of elements. We can use it to determine the relative molecular mass and relative formula mass of compounds. And we can use it to analyze the structure of new compounds or complex molecules such as proteins. So for example, um, mass spectrometry plays a major role in things like drug testing for sport. Um, it gets even especially powerful when it's teamed up with another technique called chromatography. Um, and you can see that here. So this is a modern gas chromatography mass spectrometry instrument. Quite a small thing can sit happily on the bench top in a lab. And we've got two parts to it. Here is the chromatography part. And this is the mass spectrometer part. Now what happens is you put a mixture into this and it goes very slowly through this chromatography part and it separates the mixture out into its different components. And each separate component is then analysed 
by the mass spectrometer. So we've now got this enormously powerful technique, not only to separate out a mixture into its component parts, but then to analyze each separate one. And that gives us huge amounts of information that can help us to identify all the different parts of a mixture. We're going to start now building up a much more detailed and complex picture of the structure of atoms, particularly of the electronic structure of atoms. And the starting point for that is the idea of ionization energy. Now, we will start off looking at first ionization energy, and it's really important that you memorize the full detail of this definition. So the first ionization energy of a uh, element is the energy required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of gaseous atoms. So if we look at the example of sodium, we start with gaseous atoms and we produce gaseous positive ions plus an electron. And the first ionization energy for sodium is 496 kilojoules per mole. You won't ever need to memorize any ionization energies, just the definition, but you will be expected to interpret the values of the ionization energies of different um, elements or of the successive ionization energies of a single element. So other ionization energies um, uh, are the energy required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of gaseous ions. So for example, the second ionization energy for sodium involves starting with gaseous sodium plus ions and producing gaseous sodium two plus ions. And that has an energy of plus 4,563 4, kilojoules per mole. We've also then got the third ionization energy producing sodium two plus, or starting with sodium two plus ions and making sodium three plus ions and an electron. And that's got an, a, a, an energy of plus 6,913 kilojoules per mole. And we can work these ionization energies out or measure them rather um, by just varying the intensity of an electron beam which is used to knock the electrons off the atoms we're measuring. So successive ionization energies, what we're talking about here is looking at all of the individual ionization energies for a single element. Um, and the main thing we need to do is to look at the graph. So on the x-axis of the graph, we've got the ionization energy we're talking about. So one, two, three, four, and so on. And on the y-axis, we've got the actual energy it takes to remove that electron. Now, it is the log of the ionization energy purely because that's a way to help make the graph a bit more compact and fit it all on one axis. Now, in general, we've got this upwards slope. So as the number of electrons we're removing increases, the ionization energy also increases. And that's because it gets harder to remove each electron because it is becoming from an increasingly positive ion. However, note this is not a single sharp, a single smooth slope, but there are these jumps in it. So there is this large jump going from the first to the second ionization energy. And there's another large jump going from the ninth to the 10th ionization energy. And that provides us evidence for the existence of electron shells. Because the reason why the second electron is so much harder to remove than the first electron is because it's coming from a closer shell to the nucleus. So the first ionization energy represents losing this electron here. The second ionization energy represents losing one of these electrons. Now, this is on a shell closer to the nucleus. Now, the reason that's so much harder to remove is because of something called shielding. Shielding is the idea that the inner electrons block the effect of the nucleus from the outer electrons. That means the electrons on the outside, these guys, have or experience what we call lower effective nuclear charge because of the effect of the inside electrons shielding it from the nucleus. So the reason this second electron here is so much harder to remove than the first one is because it experiences less shielding. Therefore, the effective charge of the nucleus is so much greater. Now, the next few electrons are all harder to remove than the other, but the slope is more gradual because all of these are coming from the same shell with the same amount of shielding. All of those electrons are coming from this second shell. So they've all got the same amount of shielding. So the difference in ionization energy is relatively small. Then 
going from the 9th to the 10th uh, ionization energy, we get another one of these big jumps. And that's because now we've got rid of all of our we've got rid of all of our shell two electrons and now we're talking about the electrons on the first shell so again they experience even less shielding than the others and so the effective nuclear charge for them is even greater so they're that much harder to remove so this pattern of the first iron so of the successive ionization energies is really good evidence for the existence of electron shells because electron shells is the only way we can explain these big jumps there and big jumps there because we're going into a new shell now the emission spectrum of an element is what what you get if you heat uh, the vapor of an element or maybe excite it with electricity such that it starts to glow now as the uh, atoms of the element absorb energy it causes electrons to jump up uh, from one shell to another when those electrons drop back down so we say when they decay from a higher shell to a lower shell they give out a photon of light and the wavelength of that photon of light corresponds to the amount of energy they've lost dropping down from one shell to another and different drops release different amounts of energy which means different wavelengths of light so if we pass the light from what we call one of these discharge tubes if we pass that light through a spectrometer it separates the light into the individual bands of uh, light it's produced from and each one of these bands corresponds to a different transition go from one energy level down to another and again this is really good evidence for the existence of shells because you can't really explain why these individual bands occur if you don't um, if you don't have this model of shells to explain it so energy levels what we've always talked about as shells in our kind of simple language actually represent what we now call quantum energy levels and what we say is that all electrons at the same energy level so all electrons in the same shell have the same amount of energy the first shell has the lowest energy the second shell has the second lowest energy and so on and so we can draw that something like this so here that there is the first shell with the lowest energy then we've got the second shell with the second lowest energy third shell and so on now we're going to be drawing these energy level diagrams and we represent uh, electrons in these diagrams as arrows okay and you'll notice that some of those arrows are pointing upwards and some of them are pointing downwards this represents a property of electrons that we call spin and we say that some electrons are spin up and some electrons are spin down now whether the electrons are really actually you know spinning on their heads um, like you or i might is another matter it doesn't really matter exactly what spin means it is just a property now importantly electrons tend to pair up with opposite spins so a, an electron with spin up can pair with an electron that is spin down but two spin ups and two spin downs cannot pair with each other now when we think about energy level diagrams um, electrons fill up the energy levels from the bottom up so if we look uh, here we can see that uh, we've got two electrons this is for sodium by the way um, we've got two electrons filling up that bottom energy level then eight filling up the second one look at the way they're paired up with spin up and spin down and then we've got one electron in that third energy level and we can, again we can use this to explain our graph from the uh, ionization successive ionization energy slide so the reason why the successive ionization energy increases as we go okay this first electron we're re we're removing it from an energy level that's already quite high so it won't take much energy to remove it completely from the atom because it's already got quite a lot of energy because it's in a higher energy level these next eight electrons are in the second energy level here okay so these have got a bit less energy than the first one that was removed so we're going to have to give them more energy in order to get them away from our atom and then third lastly we've got the electrons these two electrons here these we're removing from the first energy level now the first energy level has very low energy so in order to get them off our atom we're going to have to give them a lot of energy which is why the um, last two ionization energies are so high this helps to explain our pattern of successive ionization energies 
what we're going to learn now is that there are three levels of the electronic structure of atoms. Now we've only met one of those levels so far. This is what we learned at GCC about the idea of shells. Now we just learned on the previous slide that we should really be calling these quantum energy levels. Um, and actually we can refer to this value called N. N is the principal quantum number. Okay. Now, when N is one, we're talking about the first shell, which we know holds two electrons. When n is two, when the principal quantum number is two, we're talking about the second shell or the second energy level, which holds eight electrons. When n is three, this might be new to you from G because this is not what we learn at GCC. When n is three, we can hold 18 electrons in that third shell. And when n is four, in that fourth shell of energy level, we can hold 32 electrons. Okay. Now this just kind of makes sense because as we're going up in terms of our energy levels, we're getting further from the nucleus. And so there's just physically more space to hold electrons. Now, where this starts to get much more complicated is that each of our shells or uh, quantum energy levels, each of them is broken up into a series of subshells. Okay. And we have different flavors of subshell. We have S, P, D, and F subshells that can hold two, six, 10, and 14 electrons respectively, okay? And the number of subshells you get varies as your principal quantum number increases. So when your principal quantum number is one, there is only a one S subshell. At principal quantum number two, we get an S subshell, which we call the 2S, and we get a P subshell called the 2P. Now, if you remember, the S subshells hold two electrons. The P subshells hold six electrons. This is why the second shell holds eight electrons in total. When the principal quantum number is three, we get an S subshell again, the 3S. We get a P subshell, 3P, and we get a D subshell, the 3D. Now again, the S subshell here holds two electrons, the P holds six, and the D holds 10 electrons. This is why the third shell can hold 18 in total. And finally, the F, sorry, the, uh, when the principal quantum number is four, we're gonna get an S subshell, a P subshell, a D subshell, so the 4S, 4P, and the 4D. And also there will be an F subshell, and again, we're going to spot the pattern. The S holds two, the P holds six electrons, the D holds 10 electrons, and the F subshell holds 14 electrons, which is why our fourth shell can hold up to 32 electrons. Okay. And now just to make things even more complicated, each subshell is itself divided into an even finer level of detail called an orbital. Okay. Now an orbital is a three-dimensional region of space that can hold up to two electrons. Importantly, those two electrons must have opposite spins. So if an orbital has two electrons in it, one will be spin up, one will be spin down. Don't ask what if they both end up with the same spin. Physically not possible. Has never happened in the entire history of the universe. Now, different subshells have different numbers of orbitals. So an S subshell only holds, only has one orbital in it. A P subshell holds three orbitals. A D subshell is made of five orbitals and the F subshell is made of seven orbitals. Now, if you remember that each orbital can hold two electrons, this explains the number of electrons that are held in each subshell because one times two gives you two electrons in the S subshells. Three times two gives you six electrons in the P subshells. 5 times 2 gives you 10 electrons in the D subshells, and 7 times 2 gives you 14 electrons in the F subshells. So that's the sort of idea of the three different levels of structure. We've got our quantum shells, which is the, um, the shells that we used to from GCSE, subdivided into subshells, and each of those is broken down into individual orbitals. What we're going to look at now is how that sort of all fits together to produce the electronic structure of an atom.
we need to understand orbitals a little and where they came from. And they uh, have come from the idea, really, that um, electrons have properties of both a wave and a particle. This is something we call wave particle duality. Now, this is very difficult to get your head around. But one of the first people who, who worked really well on it was um, a gentleman called Erwin Schrodinger, who was um, he did most of his work in the early part of the 20th century. Now, he developed what is called Schrodinger's wave equation. This is Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's wave equation. You can see it is frighteningly complicated. And when I uh, did my degree, this was a source of much terror for me. Now, orbitals are simply solutions to Schrodinger's wave equation um, that just describe where you're, where there's a sufficiently high probability of finding an electron at any given point. So s orbitals are one of those solutions, and they look like this. s orbitals are spherical. Um, note the way it's drawn here. It's darker red in the centre and increasingly light red as you move away from the centre. That just means that there's the most probability of finding an electron in the middle, and that gets less as you move away. In terms of the way you might draw it in an exam, just draw it as a circle or a sphere like that. Um, Note that although we draw them as circles, they are actually three-dimensional, so they are a proper sphere, as you can see from the x, y, and z axes there. Now, you get one s orbital per quantum energy level, so there's one s on the first shell, there's a two s on the second shell, and a three s on the third shell. All the same shape, but just getting gradually bigger as we move up the numbers. Okay. Now, p orbitals are very different. p orbitals are dumbbell-shaped. That's how we describe it, not really like dumbbells, but you know what I mean. So, um, we've got a sort of blob of charge up and a blob of charge down. Now, note that because p orbitals are, or electrons rather, are fairly magical, somewhat like unicorns, they can travel from here to here without going through the space in between, but that's, that's a whole other story. Now, what we've got here, this is the pz orbital, but there's also a similar one at right angles to it on the x-axis called the px orbital, and also a py orbital. So the three um, p orbitals sit at right angles to each other and we can see them drawn here so here's the pz here's the px um, and here's the py now three per quantum energy level so we name them after the energy level they're in so in the second shell we've got the 2px the 2py the 2pz in the shell, third shell we've got the 3px 3py 3pz and so on we need to understand now how electrons fill the orbitals are, that are available to them. And we describe this using something called the Aufbau principle, which comes from the German word Aufbau, which means to build up. So according to the Aufbau principle, electrons go into the lowest available orbital first. Okay. An orbital is full when it contains two electrons with opposite spin. And when there are multiple orbitals at the same energy level, those, the electrons fill those orbitals singly before they pair up. So how does this work in practice? Let's look at the example of hydrogen. First of all, hydrogen, Z equals one, it has one electron. So that one electron will go into the one S orbital like that. And so we can write the electronic structure of hydrogen as one S one. Beryllium has four electrons. So we're gonna fill up the orbitals in the order they're available. So 1s, so um, one electron, two electron, that's now the 1s th that's full. So we're gonna move up to the 2s, one electron, two electron. Now we've used all the four electrons of beryllium, and so now we've got the electronic structure of beryllium, 1s2, 2s2. Note that a couple of things about the way we write this, first of all, the, um, the numbers used to indicate how many electrons are in the orbital are superscript that's the first thing the second thing to note is that there is no space between each orbital so sodium z equals 11 now so it's going to have 11 electrons so start again first two go into the 1s 1 2 then the 2s 3 4 then we get to the 2p now note rule 3 says orbitals fill up singly first so we're going to go 4 five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's the 2p level filled up. And then we get one more electron in the 3s, which leads us to the electronic structure of sodium as 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. And now we look at argon with z equals 18. So 
we're already at 11, so we'll carry on from there. So 11 electrons, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So the electronic structure of argon then is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. That is the alpha valve principle. Electrons go to the lowest orbital first. The orbital is full when it contains two electrons with opposite spin, and the electrons fill orbitals at the same energy level singly before they pair up. Electrons in boxes notation is a way to draw the electron configuration of an atom, um, and we draw each subshell as a block of boxes, uh, and there is one box for each orbital a subshell contains. So S subshells just have one box, so they've got one orbital. P subshells have three boxes because they contain three orbitals and so on. And you fill them with arrows representing electrons. Arrow up for spin up, arrow down for spin down. And it just works similar to what we saw before. So lithium's got three electrons and it goes one, two, three, like that. Carbon has got six electrons. One, two, three, four. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. But again, note that third part of the alphabet principle is that the orbitals fill up singly before the electrons pair up. So the electrons in carbon, we get one in two different orbitals rather than having two paired up in one orbital like that. So make sure you get the single filling. Equally with nitrogen, look, the electrons in the p orbitals in nitrogen are one in each orbital rather than being paired up. And it's only when we get up to... Um, things like oxygen that the electrons will start to pair up in those p orbitals. If you've never stopped to appreciate the structure of the periodic table, please do so now because the structure of the periodic table was developed well before we knew any of this detailed stuff about, you know, uh, electron shells and subshells and orbitals. And yet, the existence of those things is reflected in the structure of the periodic table. So let's start with the basics. The basics is we've got periods. Periods are the rows on the periodic table. Um, and the period number represents the principal quantum number. So it tells us the number of shells. So things in the first period have one shell, electron shell. Second period have, has two shells. Third period has three shells, and so on. And they're called periods because periods, or periodicity, refers to when you have repeating patterns. And as we move along the first period, we see, and the second period, and the third period. We see patterns repeating themselves in terms of the structure of elements, their melting temperatures, their boiling temperatures, their reactivity, their density. We see these patterns repeating again and again as we work across those periods. The second level of structure is the idea of groups. So we have group one, group two, group three, group four, group five, and um, all the way up to here, we need to get used to calling this group eight rather than group zero, all the way up to group eight, okay? Now groups are these columns uh, and each step down a group increases the um, uh, principal quantum number n by 1 and elements in the same group have a similar electronic structure. So if you look at the alkali metals here which is group 1 we can see lithium is 1s2 2s1, sodium is 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s1 Potassium, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. So they all have, they all sort of complete their electronic structures with a singly occupied s orbital. And equally, if you look at the structure of their ions, the structure of their ions all end in the same way as well. And importantly, things in the same group have similar chemical properties. Now we're going to look on the next slide in a bit more detail about exactly how the periodic table is reflected in the structure of atoms. So in the paper table we talk about blocks. So we have these four different blocks, S block, P block, D block, and F block. Now the S block is the elements here. Strictly speaking, we should also include helium, okay? We don't tend to because it doesn't function like an S block element. Also notice that hydrogen there is included, and yet often hydrogen is put somewhere in the middle because again it doesn't really fit with the patterns of the other elements of group one now the s block um all the elements in the s block have their last electrons in their s orbitals remember the s orbital can hold two electrons and note that the s block is two elements wide 
and that contains the reactive alkali metals, lithium down to francium, and the not quite as reactive, but still very reactive alkali earth metals, beryllium down to radon. Then we have the P block. These all have the last electrons in their P orbitals, and we're talking about this section here. Now here's our P block. This contains all of the, or nearly all of the non-metals, and a lot of less reactive metals as well. And again, note the P block contains six electrons, or the P orbitals rather, contain six electrons, and notice the P block is six elements wide. Then we have the D block. These contain the last electrons in D orbitals. D orbitals can hold 10 electrons, and it is 10 elements wide. These are all metals, um, but they tend to be less reactive than the S block metals, and they are often known as the transition metals. We'll learn a lot more about these in the year 13 part of the course. Finally, we've got the F block down here. The F block contain the uh, elements have their last electrons in F orbitals. Um, F orbitals can hold 14 electrons, so this block is 14 elements wide. Just note the F block should really belong just here in that section there. Let's draw that in blue so you can see it in that section there. We don't draw it that way in practice because you'd end up with a very long impractical periodic table and you very, very rarely meet those elements anyway, so we can largely ignore them as chemists. Um, all of them are metals, many of them are unstable and radioactive, uh, and we often call them the lanthanoids and actinoids. Now, when we look at the electronic structures of the fourth period, they are complicated by the fact that the third and fourth shells overlap in energy, which is not the case elsewhere. If we look at the first shell, for example, it is entirely lower in energy than the second one. There's no overlap at all. And equally, the third one is completely higher in energy than the second one. But when we look at the fourth shell, it overlaps with the third one. So the 4s orbitals are lower in energy than the 3d orbitals. And that will complicate the way that the orbitals fill up. And we need to understand that and be able to take account of it. So as a general rule, the 4s orbitals fill up before the 3d ones. So if we look at something like calcium, where Z equals 20, so it's got 20 electrons, the electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2b6, 3s2, 3b6. And rather than being 3d2, which you might expect, it's actually 4s2, because the 4s energy, uh, so uh, orbital, is lower in energy than the 3d orbitals. So the 4s will fill first. This leads to um, electron configurations or structures for scandium to zinc, which look a little bit odd because we have the 4s filling first and then the 3d. So for example, vanadium, Z equals 23, 23 electrons, 1s2, 2s2, 2b6, 3s2, 3b6, 4, 3d3, 4s2. Note the way it's written. Even though the 4s2 fills first, we write it second. So we're still going to have the 3d written first, but look, it's only got three electrons in it. So it hasn't filled before the 4s. The 4s is full, and then the 3d starts filling up. Now, to make things even more complicated, we've got copper and chromium. Now, the thing is, because our 4s and our 3d are so close in energy level, what we find is that with both copper and chromium, once one electron is in that 4s orbital, it actually moves it up to a higher energy level than the 3d. And so we get this really odd thing happen, where chromium, for example, z equals 24, 24 electrons goes 1s2, 2s2, 2b6, 3s2, 3b6, 4s1, one electron goes into the 4s, and then the others go into the 3d. So we might expect chromium to be 3d4, 4s2. That's the pattern that the others have done, but it doesn't do that. It goes 4s1, 3d5. Similarly with copper, we might expect copper, copper z is 29, we might expect copper to be yada 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 3d 9 4s2 but because that orbital gets the 4s gets pushed into a higher energy level it ends up as 4s1 and 3d 10. just a little note that's also worth making about the way we write the electron configurations of these more complex ones even though the 4s orbital fills before the 3d we write it afterwards and that's because we want to make sure 
when we write our configurations, we keep the shells together. So we've got the first shell, the second shell, the third shell, and the fourth shell. And even though the um, 4S is filling before the 3D, we still write it after because we want to put the shells in order. We need to be able to write the electron configuration for ions as well as for atoms. So for positive ions, remember they're formed by losing electrons. Electrons are going to come from the orbitals of the outermost principal shell in the order they are written. Okay. So if you look at zinc and zinc 2 plus, zinc, the electron configuration or structure is 1s2, 2s2, 2b6, 3s2, 3b6, 3d10, 4s2. Now we know that the 4s fills before the 3d because it's lower in energy level. So you'd expect the 3d to empty first as well, but that is not the case. The electrons from a zinc 2 plus ion are taken from the 4s orbital. So its electron configuration will be 1s2, 2s2, 2b6, 3s2, 3b6, 3d10. It's the two 4s electrons that are missing. Just note, there's a little way we can shortcut the way we write this. So rather than writing out the whole thing, we can do what's called a condensed electronic structure, where we just put for this one, AR in brackets, okay, in square brackets, and then just the interesting bit, the electronic structure here. So when we put AR in brackets, it means all of the electronic structure of argon plus this extra bit that we just drawn on. Okay. Now for a negative ion, remember they're formed by gaining electrons, we're just going to fill up any incomplete subshells. So for example, if we look at fluoride, sorry, uh, fluorine and fluoride, F and F minus, fluorine is 1s2, 2s2, 2b5, or we can write that as He, 2s2, 2b5. And fluoride, we're just going to fill up that empty 2p subshell. So it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2b6, because now that, um, that, that incomplete 2p5 is now full at 2p6. Noble gases, we should note, do not form ions because they have complete shells, so they are stable. Um, and it's also worth noting that all of the ions achieve what we call a noble gas configuration. So if we look at um, fluoride here, it now has the same configuration as the noble gas neon. We are going to look at transition metal ions, but not just yet. We'll come across those in year 13 because the rules for this get a little bit more complicated. Periodicity. This is the idea that the periodic table shows repeating periodic patterns as you work your way across a period. So that means the same patterns occur in the same places in each period. And there's a lot of properties that demonstrate periodicity, including melting temperature, first ionization energy, electrical conductivity, atomic radius, the formula of the oxides of each element, and the chemical reactions that they do. Atomic radius. If I ask most students to predict um, how the radius of an atom uh, changes as you go across a period, most, most students predict that the radius would increase, and that kind of makes sense because you, uh, you've got more protons and neutrons in the nucleus, so the nucleus is getting bigger, so the atom gets bigger, right? No, uh, not really, not at all, actually. Um, and the reason why is because we're, we're not thinking about things in the right way. Now, remember what we said before, that the nucleus of an atom is a hundred thousandth of the overall diameter of the atom. So the effect of change of the size of the nucleus is going to be absolutely tiny. What, we, what does happen is that as we go across a period from lithium to neon, so we're looking at the second period here, okay? as we go across that period, the number of protons in the nucleus increases, so the nuclear charge increases. And that means the electrons are attracted more strongly, which means that the atoms get very significantly smaller as we go across the period from lithium to neon. And in fact, if we trace the graph along, you can see that lithium atoms are more or less twice the size of neon atoms, even though they've got far smaller nuclei. And that's all to do with the effect of having a stronger nuclear charge, drawing those electrons in more tightly. Okay. So you say, well, how come sodium then is bigger than neon? Because sodium's got even more electrons. Well, yes, it does. But those electrons go into another shell, which is further from the nucleus. Okay. And so those electrons are less strongly attracted because they're that much further from the nucleus. And so that explains this sort of escalator or stairs kind of pattern that we see that within a period the atomic radius goes down and between periods it goes up so the increases are due to having more shells 
the decreases are due to increased nuclear charge. The periodicity of melting temperature and boiling temperature is best explained by understanding the differences in the bonding and structure of the elements. So, first of all, we've got a lot of them that have very low melting and boiling temperatures indeed. So, um, hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, chlorine, argon all have very low melting and boiling temperatures because they've all got either atomic or simple covalent molecular structures which have very low intermolecular forces and so you have very little energy required to melt or boil them. Now, if we look at what happens as you go from helium with its atomic structure up to lithium with its metallic structure, we get a very significant increase in boiling point and melting temperature. And indeed, that pattern follows all the way through from lithium up to carbon because all of those things have either metallic or giant covalent structures. And as you go from one to the other, the increase is explained by the idea that um, going from lithium to carbon, we go from having one electron per atom involved in bonding to four electrons per atom involved in bonding. Therefore, the bonding is stronger. Therefore, the um, melting and boiling temperatures will also be stronger. We get this big drop down as we suddenly switch from a giant covalent structure up here to a simple molecular structure down here. And we get a similar pattern of increase and sharp decrease um, mirrored in the third period as well, going from sodium uh, to silicon. We'll be looking in detail on the next few slides at the periodicity in ionisation energy. But before we understand that, we need to remind ourselves of what influences ionisation energy. So ionisation energy is affected by the size of the nuclear charge. That is the number of protons in the nucleus. The more protons, the more positive the nucleus will be. So the higher the ionisation energy, because it's harder to remove an electron from a more strongly positive nucleus. The ionisation energy is decreased by the distance from the nucleus. So the greater the distance from the nucleus, the weaker the attraction to the nucleus, and therefore the lower the ionisation energy. So that is the case when an electron is in a higher shell that is further from the nucleus. And to compound that, we've got the effect of shielding. So shielding is the repulsion of outer electrons by the inner electrons. And its effect really is to reduce what we call the effective nuclear charge that an electron experiences. So the more shells, the more shielding there is, and the lower the ionization energy of an electron in that shell. So if we look first of all at the periodicity in the first ionization energies, it has some very interesting patterns that we need to be able to explain. So we have this sort of general kind of zigzag down pattern um, with some quite fine details which we'll look at in the next few slides but we can break it down into looking at the increases there's increases there increases here increases here and so on those increases are due to increases in nuclear charge making it harder to remove electrons okay we'll also look at the decreases and there are decreases there are very big decreases there and there and there but there are much smaller decreases here and here, here and here. They're due to additional shielding, making it easier to remove electrons, greater distance from the nucleus, making it easier to remove electrons, and repulsion between paired electrons, making them easier to remove. So let's look at the ionization energies from hydrogen to beryllium, first of all. So first of all, going from hydrogen to helium there's a very significant increase. Helium has the highest first ionization energy. And that increase comes from having greater nuclear charge. We've got two protons rather than just one. And the amount of shielding is the same. So therefore, it's much harder to remove the electron from helium than it is from hydrogen. Then we go from helium to lithium. And we get this massive decrease. The reason for that is because the electron, the first electron in helium, so lithium rather, is coming from an additional shell. Therefore, the distance from the nucleus is greater, so it's easier to remove it. And there's more shielding, because you've got an inner shell shielding the outer shell. So there's also increased shielding, and therefore there is um, less attraction to the nucleus. And again, it's easier to remove that electron. And then if we go to beryllium, there's now an increase again, because the uh, nuclear charge has increased while the amount of shielding stays the same. So therefore, it's harder to remove the first electron from beryllium than it is from lithium. As we move from beryllium to neon, things get a bit more complicated because we have these two zigzags down that we need to explain, and they happen for very different reasons. So 
Firstly, going from beryllium to boron. That little drop there. How do we explain that? The reason for that, and it's a little decrease rather than a big decrease, is because rather than starting a new shell, which explained the big drop there, we're starting a new subshell. So the electron in beryllium is coming from the 2s subshell. The first electron in uh, boron is coming from the 2p subshell. Now that 2p subshell, on average, is slightly further away from the nucleus and it experiences slightly more shielding because it's shielded by the 2s that's inside it. And so both those factors mean that there is a decrease in the effective nuclear charge and therefore it's easier to remove the electron from boron than it is from beryllium. Now as we go from boron to nitrogen, we go back to our familiar pattern of increase as the nuclear charge increases because we're getting more protons whilst the shielding stays the same, so the effective nuclear charge is increasing and therefore the ionisation energy increases. Okay, But then we get another one of our pesky little drops. And why is that happening this time? Now, we're still in, this, we're still in the 2p subshell, so we can't explain it in the same way as we did for boron, um, sorry, as we did for beryllium to boron. We've got to look now at the effect of electron pairing. So if we think about the electrons going into uh, the elements from boron up to uh, neon, the electrons are going into the three 2p orbitals. This is the 2px, the 2py, and the 2pz. The electron in boron goes there. Okay. Alpha principle tells us that orbitals fill up singly, so the next one goes there. That's the electron for carbon, and then that's the electron for nitrogen. Okay. Now, on to this drop going from nitrogen to oxygen. Oxygen's uh, last electron has to pair up in one of the 2p orbitals. Now, two electrons in an orbital will repel each other slightly, and that increases their energy and just makes them that little bit easier to remove, which is why the ionization, first ionization energy of oxygen is lower than nitrogen because of the effect of pairing up the electrons. And we have the same for all the subsequent ones. They're all paired up. So all of the ionization, first ionization energies for oxygen, nitrogen, so oxygen, fluorine, and neon are slightly lower than they would have been. You can imagine if we sort of carried on the graph up there, all of them you would expect to be that much higher up if it wasn't for the effect of the repulsion of electrons being paired up uh, in the same orbital. And we can see this exact same pattern of um, uh, changes being repeated in the third period. So this is the big decrease as we start a new shell. Increase as we go um, into the second group. Decrease here as we start a new subshell. Increase, increase. Slight decrease due to electron pair repulsion. Increase again. Then another decrease as we go down. And then obviously we get to the D, um, the D orbitals over here and that gets a little bit more complicated. And the last little bit to look at is trends of ionization energies within a group. This is much, much easier to get your head around. Um, the basic trend is that the first ionization energy um, as you go down a group always decreases. Um, so if we look at group eight, helium, neon, argon, krypton, there's a very clear downward trend. There is also a downward trend for lithium, sodium, potassium. It's less pronounced, but it is still there. And if we pick any, any other things in the same group, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus, there's a downward trend, beryllium and magnesium, there's a downward trend. And that's always for the same reason. It's because um, as we move down the group, we've got more shells. Therefore, there's a greater distance on the nucleus and there's more shielding, both of which mean that the electrons are easier to remove. Thank you. The end.